Good morning and uh, welcome everyone. My name is John Huntsman and I am board chair of the Atlantic Council and we welcome one and all here this morning for this very special and extraordinary event. We are honored to have with us today His Excellency Mohammed Mansif Marzuki, President of the Republic of Tunisia. And Mr. President, this overflow room speaks to the great character and esteemed credentials of you, as well as Washington's sincere admiration for your country and for what Tunisia has accomplished thus far in its democratic transition. Now, we're live streaming this event, and we encourage all of those here today and tuning in online to use the hashtag ACTunisia to join the conversation on Twitter. Now, it is truly remarkable when one reflects on how far Tunisia has come. Three and a half years ago, a young Tunisian fruit vendor self-immolated out of a sense of hopelessness and despair. This act of desperation morphed into a movement of peaceful protest, sparking a popular uprising in which the Tunisian people voiced their grievances and made legitimate demands for more political and economic opportunity and successfully ousted the former regime. The post-revolutionary journey has not been easy. The assassinations of high-profile political leaders last year shook Tunisian society to its very core. Escalating political tensions that threatened to derail the transition. Ultimately, the various stakeholders mustered the political will to negotiate and engaged in a national dialogue and committed to a consensus-based roadmap. In January, of this year, Tunisia adopted a new constitution, considered the most progressive in the Arab world. And the country is now preparing for parliamentary and presidential elections later this year. That will be a critical turning point. President Marzouki has played a central role in all of these events and has been instrumental in Tunisia's current success. A physician and longtime human rights activist he was exiled from Tunisia for over 10 years for daring to stand up to the Ben Ali regime. He continued his activism abroad, was appointed head of the National Committee for the Defense of Prisoners of Opinion, and returned to Tunisia in 2011, immediately following the Jasmine Revolution. He was elected to his current position by the National Constituent Assembly in December 2011 serving his country through its trials and triumphs of the democratic process. <clears throat> Recognizing President Marzouki's tireless commitment to democracy and human rights, in the summer of 2012, the Atlantic Council presented him with the Council's Freedom Award, a delegation that included former Congressman Jim Colby and retired General George Casey personally presented the award to him at the Presidential Palace in Tunis. So our organization has a cherished relationship with you, Mr. President, making this occasion an opportunity to host you even that much more special. I'd like to note that this event today is co-sponsored by the Atlantic Council's Rafiq Harari Center for the Middle East and the Africa Center in a joint effort to elevate the discussion of African and Middle Eastern affairs here in Washington. The Harari Center, founded in 2011 in the midst of the Arab awakening, has focused specifically on the Arab transition countries by providing a platform for policy discussion and original analysis of the political and economic dynamics of these changes. For the past three years, the Harari Center has worked to elevate attention to Tunisia, and to underscore the importance of its success with the broader aim of fostering prosperous, democratic countries throughout the Arab world. We're very eager to he hear the President's thoughts on these issues and to engage in a conversation with you following his remarks. So ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, it gives me great honor and privilege to turn this podium over to His Excell Excellency, President Marzouki of Tunisia.
Thank you so much. Honorable Director Kemp, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I, I must confess that I am very moved to be here. I feel uh, that I have to answer your questions, but I'm not quite sure that I have all the response because myself, I'm looking for some of them. Last week, uh, I, uh, I received in my home uh, Tawakkul Kurman. Uh, you probably know that she is uh, a leading human rights activist in Yemen and that she is a uh, Peace Nobel Award. And with her, uh, one of my best Egyptian friend, Ayman Noor. And both of them, they told me, Mr. President, you are the last hope. You, I mean Tunisia, not myself. You, Tunisia, are the last hope because you see that everything is going. We, did, we never expected the, the Arab Spring to turn out to be this horrible civil war in, in, in Syria, this chaos in Libya, uh, come back to the dictatorship in, in Egypt, and so forth. So you are the only hope. And you have to succeed not only for Tunisia, but for the, for the whole Arab world. And we do feel this burden because Tunisia is a small country, as you know, it's a modest country. We never expect, we never expect in our history to be, uh, to be responsible or so responsible of. Uh, we were the first to be surprised by the sparking by the, uh, of the Arab Spring from Tunisia. We were the first surprised of the, how important Tunisia should be. Uh, has, has become for many Arabs and for many, many Westerners and so forth. And this is why, yes, we think that we have an obligation. Yes, we must be a success story. This is, what, this is our feeling. Would we reach this objective? I don't know. I hope so. I'm doing all my best to do so. But we know that it's extremely difficult. First of all, because, of course, we have our internal problems, but, but Tunisia is not an island. Tunisia is surrounded by a lot of countries, you know, having their own problems and exporting their own problems to us. For instance, Libya. Currently, we, are, we have an important crisis, humanitarian crisis uh, on our borders because we are suffering from what's happening in Libya. We suffered also what's, what happened in Mali. Uh, a lot of our young people now are training uh, in jihad in Syria, and they are probably going back to Tunisia. One day and another, we are probably going to face them. So uh, the challenge is not only national, it's also uh, regional. But I can also be proud to I can say that we, uh, you know, we, have, we have had to face three major challenges. And I can say that, well, if you compare our situation to the Arab country, other Arab country, we can say that we did, we did it. Uh, the first major crisis, of course, was the political crisis. The political crisis, uh, Tunisia is a divided society, secularist and Islamist, social uh, classes, um, poor and rich, young and et cetera, et cetera. And reaching a consensus was not easy. But we did it. We did it, and we have had this constitution. I'm very, very proud of our constitution, not because what's written in, but because of the process. We have had thousands of hours of di discussion. Thousands of people have particip participated in discussing this constitution. And this is why it's our constitution. Every Tunisian feels that this constitution is his. So uh, we reached also consensus about government, about the first government, the second government, and now the third government was also fruit of this uh, uh, consensus. Uh, we, we decided that we are going to stick to uh, uh, our own values. I mean, in Tunisia, no journalist has been sent to prison. We, uh, no uh, television has been shut, shut down like in other countries. Uh, we have protected human rights value. We have protected uh, civil liberties. And this is in, in a context, extremely difficult context. And this is why I think we, we can be proud of ourselves because, you know, when you are a human activist in the opposition, you talk, you're talking about uh, protecting values, etc. But when you are in charge and when you are facing the real problems, that's, th that's the, 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 the real test, the real test of uh, how really you are, uh, uh, you are convinced by what you are saying. 
And I think the, the whole um, political uh, uh, spectrum of Tunisia, we, we did stick to this human rights values for, for which we have fought so many times and uh, uh, against the dictatorship. So I can say that the, uh, the political crisis is now uh, behind us because first of all, we have had this constitution, this, the, the government, uh, and now because we have decided the, the, the days of elections, we are expecting that the election will be held uh, before the end of the year, and then the, really the stable institution would be uh, set up, and uh, then we can say we, we can see that we can say that really uh, the political crisis is behind us, and we we didn't revert to dictatorship, and we uh, this uh, these uh, human rights values are enshrined on the constitution, but also they have been respected uh, on the ground. Now, the second crisis, much more important, much more dangerous, is, of course, the security crisis. We didn't expect that Tunisia would become a uh, you know, country where we, where we will have uh, this uh, terrorist attacks like in, in Syria. We were a little bit naive. We thought that Tunisia is a modest country, small country, uh, moderate country, so we're not going uh, to have the same, uh, the, the same problem like in Libya, and I think that we really we were naive because, uh, of course, we have our own problems. The, the terrorism is also the, uh, has its roots in Tunisia itself because we do have an employment, an important rate of employment. We do have also, uh, you know, um, frustrated young young people, uh, but mainly, mainly this terrorist threat is imported from outside the country, from Syria, from Libya, from uh, Mali, and from... But what we are sure of now is that we are targeted by terrorist attack. We are targeted as a country, we are targeted as a model, we are targeted as a pre-democratic country. And those guys, they don't want Tunisia to succeed because, in fact, now the choice after the destruction of the dictatorship is not between revolution and counter-revolution. I do believe that the counter-revolution have no future in Tunisia, have no, uh, no future. But the choice would be uh, given to the, uh, the, to the population now is between democracy and is, uh, the political Islam, and ex specifically the extremist political Islam. This is the choice given to the population. And this, you know, this uh, uh, mainstream of Islamist extremists they really want to be the alternative to the, uh, to the dictatorship. They don't want democracy to be the alternative. This is, this is the main challenge. This is why Tunisia is targeted by these guys, and this is why they will put all the, all the pressure on Tunisia so Tunisia don't, doesn't become a success story. This is the problem. Of course, we, we, uh, we have the, the third crisis. We have to, find, uh, to face the third crisis, the economic crisis. You, you can understand very easily that during this period, foreign investors are not very keen to come to Tunisia and to invest, even the internal uh, investors, of course, they are very cautious. And all of them are saying, look, we, we, let's wait uh, this uh, transition period to be over, and then we will be, come and invest. But meantime, meanwhile, we, 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 the rate of unemployment is growing, and uh, frustration is growing, and the young people, uh, saying, look, we, we, we expected that the revolution would be a solution. Now we think that it's part of our problem because we have more and more, uh, more and more trouble and more and more uh, poverty. And this is really the, the, the most extremely dangerous situation because if we just bring democracy to the population without employment, without, without it, it, it won't work. It won't work, and people would say, some people now at Indonesia are regretting, you know, the, the dictatorship because they say, at that time, uh, we have the stability, we have the, the rate of employment was not, of course, was not very, uh, but now we, we, we are getting poorer and poorer. This is why it's extremely urgent for us, you know, to finish with, the, with this uh, transitional period and then to have this the economic machine go, uh, working uh, again. So let me just tell you why Tunisia is so different, why the outcome of the Arab Spring in Tunisia is a little bit better, and why Tunisia 
can become a success story, why, why we, you can bet on Tunisia. We are not better than uh, Syrian or Egyptian or Libyan and so forth. We are just the same human beings, you know. But the society, of Tun the Tunisian society is quite different. Tunisia is a small country. Tunisia is a middle class country. Tunisia is an educated country. Homogeneous country. We don't have, you know, like in, in Syria, you know, this um, uh, Shia, Sunni, etc. All Tunisians are Arab, Muslim, Sunni. So this is why it's easy in Tunisia. But the most important thing is that in Tunisia, there is a state since uh, thousands of years. And the political opposition is, uh, is well trained. We have been harassed by the same dictator, you know, Islamist and secularist. This is why we, we learned to work together against the dictatorship. And so uh, after, after the fall of the dictatorship, we, the, the same people using to talk to each to, to, to other just uh, sat down and then decided that they are going to continue to work together. And this, this is not the, uh, the way that, that happens in Libya or in, in, in other country. So because of this uh, specificities of uh, you know, the structure of the society, the, the, the fact that we have also a very strong civil society, all those uh, conditions make that Tunisia can do it. We can make it. We can succeed this, uh, this transition. And once again, we have to, to succeed not only for us, but for the, for the Arab world. I would say also for, the demo, for democracy itself. And now I will be, uh, I, I will be very uh, frank with you. We didn't, ex we didn't have the, the, the support that we, did, we, we expect from, uh, from the West. Um, we were said, look, yes, it's, uh, what you are doing is very interesting, etc. but we wish you good luck. That's all. Uh, we expected more because the, the West uh, gave a lot more support to the dictatorship on behalf, because of the so-called stability. And now, what, I, what I'm trying to say to all my friends in, in the Western country is that if you, if you do not bet on Tunisia, if we do not support Tunisia fully, really, uh, Put all the, 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 give us all what we need uh, in matter of, uh, uh, of weapons to, 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 uh, to fight against terrorists if we don't come and invest in Tunisia if so we can give more, uh, we can give employment to our young and, and so forth. If Tunisia fails, you can say goodbye to democracy in the Arab world and for centuries, for a century. And then we are going to give all the chances to the terrorists to impose their Islamic State. This is, this is the, the challenge, and this is what we are going, talking about. So when I hear that, uh, look, uh, yes, we are going to give you some helicopters to fight against terrorists, but you have to wait two or three years, I say, no, we, we cannot wait two or three years. We need it badly. No, we did, because in three months' time, we are going to have our elections, and we are threatened by the, by the, by the terrorists, and we have to solve the problem now. This is what I'm going to tell uh, to the, um, all the U.S. officials, and uh, I hope that I will be listened to. But uh, once again, we are fighting not only for Tunisia, not only for democracy in the Arab world, but also for the democracy in the, in the world. And for a small, tiny, and modest country, it's a burden. It's a burden, and it's not easy not to do. But we have to, to, to take it on our shoulders. So please help us, and we will help you. Thank you. Mr. President, uh, thank you for that powerful, powerful statement. Um, I apologize a little for the uncomfortable chairs, but this way, this way everyone in the back can hear yes. you and see you as well. Uh, uh, you talked about being the only hope, uh, we feel the burden. Um, you talked about no journalists being sent to prison, no television shut down. Uh, you talked about the political crisis, crisis now being over, but now more of a security crisis and how you were naive about seeing this and how you're being targeted. Um, you talked very strongly about the uh, need for economic development because uh, democracy without that uh, wouldn't work. And then the unique reasons why 
uh, Tunisia has succeeded. And then most powerfully, at the end, you uh, complained uh, about not getting, uh, we, we, don't, we didn't have the support we expected from the West, we expected more. If Tunisia fails, you can say goodbye to democracy in the Arab world for a century. I think you added yeah. for a century at the end. Uh, that's a powerful opening statement, so let me pick up directly on that. Uh, you spoke a little bit about uh, uh, helicopters, but get specific here. What do you need from the outside world specifically, as concrete as you can, what's most urgent and most necessary, both in the economic field and in the security field? The security field, we need helicopters. We need about 12 helicopters. We ask the United States to uh, uh, give us about 12, 12 uh, block hawks. And uh, of course, that's extremely costful. Uh, and uh, even if we have had this money, we, it would take two or three years you know, to get them. But as I told you, we badly need them now. We need also devices for night vision, like things like that, you know, for communication and so forth. Because I have to tell you that, you know, Tunisia under the dictatorship was a policy state. So the, 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 the dictator was extremely cautious about the, uh, the, about the military. So we, uh, I, I discovered that the military, they didn't have any uh, training or any uh, arm since uh, 30 years. Hmm. So the, the, because the, the, the dictatorship, this kind of dictatorship, is extremely you know, afraid of the military. So in fact, the police was more powerful than the, than the military. Mm -hmm. But now the problem is that we are facing this new threat. And we discovered that this army hasn't been trained and hasn't got uh, all the, the, the means uh, it needs. So uh, we have to hurry up to, 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 give, to give the army what, what it's really necessary to, 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 to find against terrorists. Because these guys, the terrorists, are extremely well trained. Mm -hmm. they, are, they have been trained in Mali. They have been trained in the, sometimes 20 years in the uh, fighting against the Algerian army. Now they are well trained. But our, our own army have to be trained, ha has to be trained, and we, we badly need this uh, equipment. Training, equipment. Uh, not only training and communication also. Uh, well, I think the, the U.S. is uh, involved more and more in this, uh, in responding to our, uh, to, our, uh, to our needs. But once again, it's a matter of ur urgency, you know. It's, we cannot wait. We, we badly need it now because th the three months would be the most dangerous three months in, in our history because the, the, these the, coming three, the, months. The three months because we are going to have the, our elections in three months' time. And we are probably going to, to receive a lot of blows and a lot of coup uh, during the three, the, the th three months. They know that they have to disturb the elections. They have to prevent the elections. And the only way is to, to spread terrorism in the country. And what response are you getting, uh, it seems like a compelling message mm -hmm. to me, from the US and from others when you speak to this urgency? Do they say, yes, we're going to help you now? Mm -hmm. Or what, what do you think are the reasons why you're not getting as much help from the West as necessary in this field? Well, I, I don't understand myself, because uh, it's obvious that we to promote democracy in the Arab world, to give democracy to, uh, its chance in the Arab world, Tunisia has to be, uh, to, to be uh, helped. But sometimes I wonder, whether it was, is it because we have in this government, in our in, uh, the, the, the previous government, uh, the Islamist uh, and other party, maybe. But what we have to, uh, to, to explain to our friends that if we consider the, the Islamists just like uh, you know, one movement, it would be uh, useless. We have to consider that the Islamists is a wide spectrum. And part of the spectrum, we have to have it uh, on board you know, with us as Democrats and to isolate the, 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 the extremists. Because the terrorists are, the, sure, they are Islamists, but they are mostly extremists. Islamists. It's not because they are Islamists, it's because they are extremists. And this is what, this is what, the, the, this was the most difficult thing to explain to our French friends, you know. French, you know, for them, Islamist means, uh, and I have had a lot of problems to explain to them that we have to gain a part of the spectrum Islamists and to take it on board to be on the, with us against the extremists. Now they're considering the fact that <clears throat> it might be true. What ha what's happening now in Libya is exactly the same problem, because if we do not uh, have part of the Islamists, the moderate Islamists on board, 
it will be a war, civil war between Islamists and, uh, um, and secularists. And this is, this is exactly the Tunisian model. The Tunisian model is based on this very specific and very simple idea that we cannot have national consensus, uh, peace, uh, uh, civil uh, peace, and without having both uh, the, the, the two parts of the, the society, Islamist and, uh, and uh, uh, secularist, but the moderate part of the spectrum. Otherwise, it will be the confrontation, the bipolarization. This is what's happening in Egypt now. And th this, is, this, is the, this is the mother that we, we don't want. So your message, say, to the Egyptians or other societies that would say all Islamists are created equal is that's absolutely not wrong. What you have to bring together is the secularists exactly. and the moderate Islamists who succeed. So that's the lesson this, of Tunisia. This, this is my message. This yeah. is the essence of the model, of Tunisian model. If you want the, the, uh, the civil unrest you know, to be stopped in Egypt or elsewhere, if you want uh, the, the solution of the uh, a political solution in our country, you have to bring the moderates to the government and the, the, the moderate the Islamists and the secularists. Otherwise, you will have this confrontation, this bipolarization, and the civil war going on for years and years and decades. Let's go to the economic side of things. Are you <coughs> as, as disappointed with the West, with the US, North America, Europe, in terms of, uh, and others in the world, in terms of the economic support you're getting? Do you need more there? Well, I can understand that, uh, of course, um, businessmen are not, uh, you know, the, I can understand that businessmen wouldn't invest in a country without uh, being sure that, of course, this is their job to make money. Uh, it's our job, it's our responsibility now to, you know, to overcome the political crisis, to assure security and so forth, so they can, they can come and uh, invest. This is what we are doing. We are uh, not only fighting against terrorists, not only solving the political crisis, but also we are uh, we are writing a new uh, investment code, and we are giving all the, uh, I would say, uh, uh, how, to, how to help the investor to come to Tunisia and to work. And this, is, this is our responsibility. Uh, and I'm sure that when this uh, political crisis is over, when we are going to have the stable government, and I hope when we are going to control the security situation, I hope that Tunisia would become a hub uh, because Tunisia is, has a very interesting position in, uh, between Africa and Europe. It, Tunisia can, can play an important role in also promoting uh, development uh, in sub African, uh, sub Saharan uh, African countries. But what we, what we expect from states like the United States, France, and Europe, etc., is to help us, you know, to. to uh, uh, during this period where the, 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 the economic machine is, is plucked, is stopped. We, we, we need some, uh, for, for instance, we have had this uh, loan guarantee mm -hmm. from the United States, and this was very helpful. Mm -hmm. This is kind of, this kind of measure we were expecting. And, and in, if you could just mention one place where the support should be focused, where, yeah. should, it be, where should it be focused now? Loan guarantees? Mm -hmm. um, Yes, long guarantee. Also, uh, trying to explain to the IMF that uh, they must, of course, we we have to abide by the rules, but they must also understand that uh, we are a fragile country, a fragile society. That must consider that it's very specific. They be a little bit patient with us. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go to the audience uh, quickly. I'm just going to ask one more question now. Um, when the transition, the Arab mm -hmm. Spring, first started, I talked to uh, Foreign Minister Sikorski of Poland. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, Tunisia is going to play the role that Poland did in mm -hmm. the post-Cold War area. It will be the inspiration for so mm -hmm. many others. In a way, you've played the inspiration, but not so many others have followed. Uh, how do you think you can play a role in helping Libya navigate past the spiral of violence, number one? Number two, why do you think others have not had your success? What have they done wrong? And, the, and then the third part of this is, can you really exist in isolation if you become an island of, of uh, no. or can you not? Surely not. We cannot, we cannot uh, if we are an island, we would be, uh, you know, swallowed up. I don't think that we can resist if we are. So this is why it's uh, very important for uh, Libya, for instance, for instance, is the most important issue for us. This morning I have had a discussion with the Prime Minister of Libya, a Libyan Prime Minister about the situation. And we are dealing with the situation in Libya as an eternal uh, issue, not a matter of uh, foreign uh, policy. So 
uh, we are trying to, 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 to export our model. Uh, I just told him this morning what I'm saying now, that if you want really a um, uh, peaceful solution in the country, you have to bring people together, and we have to accept that this country should be uh, governed by a, a coalition. And this coalition is a moderate coalition of, of, uh, from the, the, the two, uh, two political uh, trends in the society, the Islamists and the secularists. This is, this is what we are saying to everybody. You know, I think you, you, why did it uh, work elsewhere? Because they s stick to the, this idea that one part of the society can over, overcome then, uh, and the second part of the society should be uh, put aside. Uh, they be believe that with the mighty, with the police and so forth, we, they can uh, overcome one part of the society, and this is useless. We, 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 this has been uh, tried so many times and didn't work. So now this society, our Arab society, are uh, are not homogeneous. We have to. Ch well, the choice is between having an inclusive government uh, based on some uh, shared value. Other, otherwise, it's the uh, the civil war uh, raging for decades and decades. Answer. So uh, let me just remind you as I go to the audience, this will be the first question. I see a number of others as well, so I'll get to you in the order I've seen you roughly. Um, and so please, right here, let me also tell you, anyone, I'm, uh, just for the record, I'm Fred Kemp, President CEO of the Atlantic Council. We're using the Twitter hashtag today, uh, uh, hashtag AC Tunisia, please. Identify yourself, please. And William Lawrence, uh, President of the American Tunisian Association. Uh, maybe a fourth priority is justice. So I was wondering if you could say something about transitional justice, justice reform, the police, you know, that, that whole side of, particularly given your, your background mm -hmm. as a human rights mm -hmm. activist, I was wondering if you uh, wanted to fill us in on where Tunisia is on that. Uh, am I to, to respond to directly? Yeah. Or, uh, no, go ahead. We'll pick, okay. we'll pick them up one. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, yes, of course, it's extremely important. Uh, this is why we have had uh, this commission of uh, truth and dignity, which uh, will play an important role, just like the one in South Africa. The, the, the South African transitional justice has been our, our model, and we're trying to copy it in, uh, in Tunisia. We have decided that really we, uh, justice must not, must not be revenge. The problem is that we have had a lot of problems you know, to set up this, uh, this jurisdiction. Now it's, uh, it's, uh, it's okay. We expect that after the elections, that this uh, tribunal would, be, would, be, uh, would work. Um, the other problem of, uh, we're facing a lot of uh, you know, corruption problems, very, very wide. And, and I am extremely uh, sad to say that after the revolution, we didn't cut, the, the corruption has grown more and more. Because the, you know, when uh, during the transitional period, the state is always weak, just because you know everybody knows that this government would do would stay one year and so forth. So um, we have had a spread of corruption, and uh, uh, we had also to deal with a uh, problem I didn't expect. Because how do you do an independent judiciary, you know, with the judge you have inherited from the old system? Uh, 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 how, how come you have, let, let's say, 200,000 judges? Uh, a lot of them have been working under the, 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 uh, under the dictatorship. And then uh, overnight, you tell them, look, you are totally independent, and then you do what, what you want, etc." We have had a lot of uh, very, very bad surprises, you know. But at the same time, you have to accept that the judiciary should be independent, but with who? And how how to get good judges, you know, to to have the, the, so this independence of judiciary wouldn't become a tool, you know, against you for political reason. So it's quite difficult. It's quite a difficult problem. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Barbara Slavin. I'm a senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council. Welcome. Um, I wanted to ask about your personal uh, political future. Will you? Retire? Will you run for president? Is there uh, an effort being made to decide who the president might be behind the scenes, or did you, do you anticipate a robust uh, contest between opposing candidates? Mm. And if I could also ask you about, about the Libya situation, whether there are some benefits that are coming to Tunisia because of wealthy Libyans, I understand, are filling the hotels of Tunis now and bringing a lot of their money over from Libya. Mm. Thank you. Well, um, um, I would be very brief on uh, 
the first question, I will give my response in uh, two months' time, you know, because I, I haven't decided yet uh, whether I will run or not. I, I think it depends on a lot of um, interna internal factors, and I have to decide. I will give my, my, my response in, uh, in uh, I think, um, probably in the, the end, at the end of September. For the Libyans, you probably know that we are on a population of 10 millions of Tunisians. We have now about 2 millions Libyans, and this is very important. Too. So when I see Italian or French you know, complaining because they have had some thousand uh, you know, immigrants coming from, uh, from Africa, I, really, I'm really, I feel extremely uh, you know, outraged because we have 2 million people in, uh, you know, in Libya. That's, that makes a difference. And we have received them very well. We have shared with them everything, our houses, our... And uh, I can say that I'm very proud of Tunisia because of this hospitality. You know, the hospitality of the poor sometimes is, is much more important than the hospitality of the rich. We we are a poor country, but we have shared everything with our brothers, uh, our, Li our Libyan brothers, and we're going to 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 continue, even if it's a burden. Uh, but once again, we. Uh, I th Tunisia is extremely important for Libyans, not only because it's the background they can uh, come to Tunisia uh, any time and they feel that this is their second country, but because also it's a model for us. We, we, we try to, be, to, you know, to succeed our experience once again because we want the Libyans to have uh, the, 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 the same, uh, I wouldn't say the same kind of state, but uh, similar, similar. Because uh, Libya is also very important for our economy. You know. The problem is Tunisia is populated without, without natural resources, and the country of Libya is, is not populated with a lot of internal, internal resources. Of course, we don't want to take the, 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 the money. Or, or we want to share with them everything. We want to, to, to promote their development, and they are very ex important for us. So uh, it's uh, uh, a win-win uh, relationship, and this is this kind of relationship we're going to promote. Thank you very much. The question in the back. Yeah, please. Uh, right here. Yes. And then. Hello. Um, my name is Roy Rosenblith. I'm the executive director of an NGO called Not In My Country, which is an anti-corruption NGO uh, that was started in East Africa. What we basically do is we upload databases of public officials and allow the public to report uh, individuals for acts of corruption. If you could just ask The question, question that I, I had, well, you, you had mentioned that corruption is a, is a widespread uh, problem emerging in Tunisia. What steps are being taken to curtail the problem? And how, what is the relationship between sectarianism and corruption? Uh, once again, uh, we have to succeed our uh, political transition, I mean. If we, uh, in three months' time, we have a stable government, uh, we have uh, uh, this constitution, we have uh, our independent judiciary and so forth, then we will have to tackle the real social problems. First, the first social problem, of course, is corruption. The second social problem is unemployment. Uh, we have also another uh, social problems, you know, people who don't uh, pay their, their, their taxes. Uh, all this problem would be tackled by a, a solid and established and legal government. Now the problem is that we are facing a lot of uh, those problems. Uh, many of many problems are uh, you know are exploring at the same time, and this government cannot do anything because everybody knows that it's weak government because it's, uh, everybody knows that the, the the minister we have, the prime minister, they they are leaving in uh, uh, three th three months time. And you cannot do anything really serious. Uh, you cannot have a policy uh, for this very short period of time. Once again, we have to hurry up this, uh, finish this transitional period, and then tackle all the problems. And corruption is surely the, the, our uh, priority. Thank you. Uh, I have one question here, and then the front. No, go ahead, please. Good morning. Uh, I'm Shalb al Antunz al Hudra TV. Uh, President, what lesson you draw from dealing with Islamists, from engaging al Nahda in the Brotherhood of uh, Tunisia? What lesson you draw? And uh, what do, uh, would be your message to the Egyptian current regime for dealing with the Brotherhood? 
Well, I, I am I'm extremely uh, satisfied with the relationship I have had with, uh, with Nada. I'm talking as, as a secularist because uh, uh, I think they, they, play the they, they accepted the rule of the game. Um, they stick to the, the democratic values during the time they were uh, in power. They now they accepted uh, uh, yeah, to, to give the power to the uh, technocratic government uh, to assure every, everybody that the elections would be uh, fair and transparent election. So, uh, and once again, I, I repeat what I have said and what I'm going to, to repeat every time. If you want a political situation in any country, you have to have an inclusive government. You have to have every, all the political actors. It's, it's a nonsense to believe that any social uh, or political party in, in a country like uh, any Arab country can be the leader, can uh, do exactly what has, that has been done during the, 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 the five decades and which lead to the, to, the, to the revolution. This is my message. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Danya Greenfield, the acting director of the Hurry Center. While the microphone is coming to her, let me just salute the team that works these transition issues mm -hmm. for us at the Hurry Center. Uh, Danya leading at Karim Mezran, working in North Africa issues, our new director, Frank mm -hmm. Richardone, former ambassador to Egypt and, uh, mm -hmm. and Turkey, and of course our board member leading uh, the Hurry Center activities, Rafik Bizri, so salute to all of you. Uh, please, Danya. Thank you, Mr. President. We're very honored to have you here. My question is actually a direct follow-up uh, on the previous question, looking at Egypt, and you made this very astute distinction between the range of Islamists and extremist and the need to make that distinction. And it seems quite clear that um, the current Egyptian government is, is not making that distinction um, and has lumped them together in, in one category in large part. And I'm wondering actually if you could reflect on some advice actually for the international community, for the United States and Europe, about how best to work with Egypt and the current government there in moving more towards a perspective that you've outlined and that you've embodied of inclusiveness, of pluralism, of bringing political Islam into the formal political structure so that it is not suppressed, um, pushed underground, and, and potentially further radicalized. Thank you. I will uh, respond to this question behind very close the door, you know. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I don't want to have a political uh, diplomat diplomatic crisis with Egypt. <laughs> I, I guess one way to rephrase this is, are certain situations so different that you have to take different approaches, mm. or do you think that your lessons can be applied more generally? I, 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 I do think that uh, there is no choice, you know. If you, uh, once again, if you want the, uh, y you don't have any choice. You have to have this inclusive government, you have to have people talking to each other, or you have to have people uh, listening to the other, to the, and accepting the fact that in this world, nobody can impose his will to another part of the society. This is the only message. It's, it's, I, 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 it's obvious for me, and uh, you know, it's very difficult to demonstrate what's obvious. Huh? <laughs> that's, a wonderful, that's a wonderful statement. It's difficult to demonstrate what's obvious. Last question right here. Thank you for your patience. I'm so sorry I didn't get to many of you, but this has got to be our last question because of the time constraints on the President's trip. Major Eric McCoy at the Wyoming Army National Guard State Partnership Program. We've had partnership with Tunisia for the last 10 years. Uh, here in about a month, I'll be in Tunisia for a medical event, working with Tunisian military, uh, doing a lot of things. We're going to have actually Tunisians coming to Wyoming to do a helicopter event with night vision and a FLIR. So what other Maybe types of military... Maybe some of those helicopters back with <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think our governor is willing to give that up. But, uh, sir, what are some of the other things that we as the military and with the National Guard, what can we do to assist to help you uh, help Tunisia with their successes? Training, training. We need, we need training, not only uh, devices, not only helicopters, but also training, uh, communication, and so forth. W once again, we, don't, we are a peaceful country. Uh, our uh, military have been, uh, as, I, as I told you, was uh, very uh, treated very uh, with cautiously by the, by the dictatorship. So uh, now we have to 
we have lots of, a lot of lots of time, and uh, we don't have this expertise. Really, this the expertise we need to fight this, this terrorist. So, training, training, training. Thank you for that. I, I think we can all agree that there's just a lot uh, from this interaction to think about and also think what role we can play. Um, a couple of things I just want to stay in closing. For, first of all, uh, if you could please stay in your seat so that President Marzuki can uh, leave. He has to rush to, uh, to, to another thing, and so if you would let him uh, do that. Uh, and then finally, um, we are proud at the Atlantic Council uh, that we gave you the uh, well-deserved Freedom Award on behalf of you, and, but also on behalf of the Tunisian people. I think you've captured the stakes. I think you've captured what your country has, um, uh, has, has achieved. Um, so on behalf of uh, our chairman, uh, John Huntsman, and Peter Pham of the Africa Center, everybody at the Hurry Center, I just want to thank you for taking the time with us. And we wish it's you the best pleasure. of luck in it's the time pleasure. ahead. Thank and you. you have us as thank part you. Of Good luck. Thank you.